Amen, amen. Thank you all for being back this evening. Try to keep it a little shorter tonight. Said, yeah, you've said that before. Well, y'all did give me a box of donuts this morning, so. And I will say there's still 11 in the box. But y'all were right about the maple bacon. Uh, Maple whatever, syrup bacon, whatever. They were good. It was good, so. Drew just don't know where they are. That's why. <laughs> just a reminder, too, as well, time change next weekend. Uh, so make sure you make that uh, adjustment on your clock. And then also this Wednesday night, we've got the Fall Festival. Uh, be a busy Wednesday night here. We have a lot of folks come through. Uh, certainly want to encourage everybody to come and be a part of such a, a great family night together. Um, but also as part of that, because it is such a crazy night, we don't actually do the meal that night. So just a, as a reminder to everybody, that'll be this Wednesday night. So we're going to be in the book of Philippians tonight. Told you I'd keep it a little short. We're going to go to one verse tonight, right? I heard an amen. I was waiting for that. I was waiting for somebody to go, amen. That's right. Philippians chapter 4, down in verse 19. I'm going to read off some things to you and see if anybody can guess what the title of the message is. I haven't put it up yet, so don't put it up yet, guys. All right, Mike Tyson versus Buster Douglas. Some of you know what that is. The Titanic. Okay, keep up with that. The American Revolution. The Spanish Armada. The U.S. hockey team. Defeating the Soviet Union. They called it the Miracle on Ice. And Rocky Balboa defeating Apollo Creed. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I got somebody fired up on that one. Anybody got any idea of what those things have in common? I heard a couple things. Conflict. There you go. How about sure things that were proven to be not so sure, right? Right. You think about, there was no way in the world Buster Douglas was supposed to beat Mike Tyson. There was no way in the world the Titanic, supposed to have been the greatest uh, built ship ever, was never supposed to sink, right? Even, what was the famous line, even God himself couldn't sink the Titanic. Uh, the American Revolution, certainly the, uh, the, the, the most powerful army on all the earth at the time, the British soldiers wouldn't be defeated by a bunch of farmers, and that should have never happened. The Spanish Armada, you've got this massive uh, Spanish ar- uh, fleet of ships that were defeated by the British, um, U.S. hockey team defeating the Soviet Union. They, they don't call it the miracle on ice for nothing. And then, of course, Rocky Balboa being a meat worker in a freezer should never have defeated the world heavyweight champion of the world, right? All these things are sure things you would think would happen, but actually did not happen the way they thought things would happen, even if it was written in a script in a movie. But there are very few things in this world that are sure things. Amen? You think about things that you you get these uh, products that are maybe have a lifetime guarantee. I was waiting for laughter on that one. Lifetime guarantees. Yes, we know how those are. There are certainly things that are not sure things. Uh, We think about what the word sure thing means. It means certainty. Uh, You know, we say the words in the South, surefire. That's a surefire way to do that, right? Uh, or uh, unavoidable, uh, we say that's a lock or that's a slam dunk. All these things said that, that they should happen no matter what. How about this? Anybody ever found a sure thing financial investment? Right. How about ball game results? Anybody predict some of the things that happened here recently? Nope. Even Vandy, right? How about this one, ladies? The perfect man. Well, that got more laughter than anything. <laughs> Some of you thought that at one time, right? Man, he's perfect. He's so sweet. He's so, he opens a door for me and everything, right? All these wives are looking at their husbands just shaking their head. <laughs> so, so you're telling me it wasn't a sure thing, huh? But I want to tell you this tonight, and we're going to be brief. I'm not going to keep you too long, uh, get everybody out to the subship training classes. But there are things that you can be sure of. And one of those things that you can be absolutely sure of are the promises of God. 
right? And this book right here is absolutely filled with the promises of God. And every one of them, I don't care if it's written in the Gospels, I don't care if it's written in Genesis, I don't care if it's written in the minor prophets like we talked about this morning. If God makes a promise, God will keep His promise. Amen? He has kept His promise every time He's had the opportunity, and those that He hadn't fulfilled yet, it just means it hadn't happened yet. But He's still going to fulfill every promise that He's ever made. He's never treated them lightly. So tonight, I want us to look in this one verse— And I want us to see that there are three things, three sure things that we're going to look at in one single verse. All right? So you can remember these three things. It's not going to take too long. And you'll be able to read these three things in this one single verse. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And then we'll read the verse. Father God, Lord, thank you again for tonight, Lord. Thank you for the time that we've had today, throughout the day, Lord, uh, fellowshipping in, in Sunday school and the, and, and the teaching that was going on. Thankful for so many of our Sunday school teachers, our discipleship training teachers that will be teaching in just a little bit, Lord. We're so grateful, Lord. Just the opportunity to come into your house, to fellowship together, Lord, but most importantly, to worship you. And Lord, tonight as we look upon just one of the many promises that you make throughout your word, Lord, we thank you that we can always trust in you. Every promise that has ever been made by you, Lord, we can depend on. And we're grateful for that, Lord. Thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Look with me real quick. One verse. And my God, which I love that phrase, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Jesus Christ. Anybody agree with that verse? Amen. Anybody ever lived out that verse? Amen. You have. Believe it or not, the Lord has provided. Your God has provided, supplied all your need according to His riches in glory by Jesus Christ. That is one verse that we can certainly rest upon and trust in. But in that verse, you find three things that are sure. Right? One of them is this, is that it says, all your needs. Anybody got any needs in here tonight? Every one of us do, right? Every one of us have needs in our life. We have things that have broken our heart. But in basic uh, terminology, we have two basic needs, two categories, if you will. We have those material things, right? The physical things or the temporal things that are part of this world. We have those needs all under that one, one category. And then we have spiritual needs. And every one of us have material needs, And every one of us have spiritual needs. So you can look at every need that you have, and they will fall in one of those two categories. Sometimes in our life, the way we focus upon our needs, we kind of get a wrong perspective in what we view needs to be, right? Uh, All of these things boil down to just these three things, either physical, food, clothing, shelter, whatever— or the spiritual. And you go to classifying spiritual needs, I mean, it's almost infinite, right? The the number of of needs that we have spiritually, you you can't even count. I mean, you just start thinking, how many of you have ever prayed for strength, right? Prayed for wisdom, prayed for uh, comfort. How about long-suffering, just to be able to get through something sometimes, right? We pray for all the—that's just just a few of the many things. Spurgeon said it this way when we talk about our needs versus our wants. Spurgeon said it this way. We are just a bag of wants and a heap of infirmities. (laughs) We have a lot of things. We have a lot—there's a difference between our needs and our greeds, the things that we just desire, the things that we want to happen, things that we would like to see take place. And it's amazing how our needs change over the years. Think about the times— um, we were just talking earlier, a few minutes ago, I was talking about when I was a young man, and that's been a little while ago now, uh, there was no such thing as these right here, all right? You know, we left our house on bicycles or with guns or whatever, and we went off to wherever. My mama never knew where we were. And as far as I know, she never really worried about it. <laughs> I mean, we, she didn't, we didn't come home, and finally, you know, when, the, when, the, when it got dark and the porch light was on, and she'd come in, and she didn't go, oh, thank goodness you're home safe. She never had that, you know, that was never the way she greeted us when we got home. Usually it was, go get a bath, you're nasty, right? That, that's how, but she, she didn't seem to worry about us while we were away. Well, then all of a sudden, fast forward about 30 years, and these come along. How many of your kids have one of these? 
Nobody's kids has one of these. Okay, well, y'all are good. Let's just go home. No. All of our kids have these, and if we can't get up with them quickly, what do we start doing? We start worrying, right? We start stressing. We start panicking because we can't reach them. We can't get up with them immediately. And so what we've actually added, these things were supposed to bring peace and comfort to our life, but actually they've added what? Stress to our life, things that we used to not worry about. Think about this. We were talking about think needs that have changed over time. How about vehicles? You know, we, we, anybody grow up when you had one family vehicle? One, right? How many of us could function right now in a family with just one vehicle? It's hard to do, right? Because we all have a need. We've got places we got to go. We got to go here. We got to go there. Just had a conversation. There's three people going to the same location. And because of the schedule, they all have to take different vehicles, right? One's got to leave here. One's got to go here. And that's just part of it because our needs change. But the Lord gives us a set of needs that are never changing. And what is great about the, the needs that he gives us will always depend on him for them. Sometimes we view needs as, as being a little uh, more like a want. And we think of things in more temporal mindset, a little bit not lasting as long. But honestly, the things that are truly needs, the things that we desire, that, that are the deepest that needs, we all have them. We all have them. And that's what it means in that verse when you read that. And my God shall supply all your need. In other words, Every one of us have some needs. Some of us, have, as we come in here tonight, your needs may be greater than anybody else in here. You, you may have such a burden that you're carrying around with you that nobody knows about. And you bring that need in God's house. Amen. I can't think of a better place for you to come. Some of you, you know, you don't seem to have a care in the world. <laughs> right? You don't really have that. But your needs are met. But you don't really have that burden that carries them, that, that we carry around with us. And what happens is our needs, since we're all there, they are part of who we are. But if you notice this, it says these needs are all covered by whom? Every one of them are covered by the Lord, right? Notice that. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches. Notice we all have needs and that those can all be met in Christ, every one of them, according to his riches. Uh, there's a British missionary by the name of Hudson Taylor. He said this, When God's work is done in God's way for God's glory, it will not lack for God's supply. If there's a need there, if it's strength, if you're doing it in the name of the Lord and you're doing it to trust in him, hey, God will provide for you. Maybe it's something bigger than that. Maybe it's something grander than that. Can I tell you, God will always supply. It kind of reminds me of that story of, of the old preacher. He'd been a preacher for many, many years, old veteran preacher, and he'd come into this new church in a new congregation. And of course, part of that new congregation was they wanted to kind of tell him the things that they were wanting to do and things they would love to see and, and all the plans they had and the vision and the ideas and all these things that were there. Uh, he met with the church leadership and, and, and some of the representatives of the congregation. And they sat down with him and they told him all these things and laid everything out before them. And so the next time he had an opportunity to get up in the pulpit, he started, he was just going to talk to him about all the things that he learned in his short time there with him. And one of the things he said was this, folks, I got great news. I just want to let you know this, that all the things that you have told me we need, uh, we need this, we need that, we, all these things that we need, we have all the money that we need to accomplish every one of them. And so just like some of you, you're just like looking like, where did all this money come from? All of a sudden we've got all these needs. How are we going to meet these needs? He says, here's the problem. There's only one problem with this. It's in your pockets. <laughs> so things change a little bit, right? The perspective changed a little bit. Our needs are great, but our provider is greater, right? We all have needs, and Jesus can meet every one of them. We just have to trust him with it. Look at the next part. This is the second thing. So we all have needs, according to this verse. We all have supply. Notice he says that, right? And my God shall what with all your needs? He'll listen to them? No, that's not what it says. He says he will supply, right? My God shall supply all your need according to 
his riches, all of your need. It is, it is an indication here that God is the one who provides, right? He, it is his provision that is provided for us. And it's not just that. He gives complete provision. You say, well, I need $1,000, but I only have 700 That's not how the Lord works. You need 1000 and that's the way that I'm just using money as an example. But if your need is this much, God didn't just go this much, right? God meets our needs. And oftentimes what I've said about God is when he's meeting our needs, sometimes he just shows off, right? And it's, and it's just overflowing. Uh, the, the old song that, um, goodness, just blank down on his name, brother, brother sings for us. And it talks about he's drinking from his uh, saucer because his cup's overflowing, right? There you go. That's it. That, that's the way God provides. He is supplier of needs. And, and, and I want to tell you, this is not a, an opinion. This is a fact. It says right here that God shall supply. Not I might supply. Not if you do this. God shall supply those needs. That makes me think back to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 where it says this. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. All these things shall be added to you. You ever sit down and wonder what all these things are? Think about who's providing it. The Lord. All these things. All these things. What's it talking about? What limits God's resources? Nothing. There is no limitation to what God can do, what God, the needs that God can meet, right? And sometimes we have to ask ourselves this question. If I didn't get it, did I really need it? If I didn't get it, how many of you figured out a long time ago you had something that you needed? You had to have it. You talked to mom and daddy about, I got it. I need this. I need this. I need this. And you never got it. And you look back and say, well, I guess I didn't need it either. Right? Not everything we say we need is genuinely a need. And the more genuine the need is, the more full the supply is from our Lord. That's how he works. So we've got needs. He's got the supply. And the very first part of it is what we all need to remember. Everything centers around my God. Right? And that's why that verse is written that way. It's a personal uh, relationship that you have with the Lord. The great provider, right? And it says, and my God. And my God. This directs us straight to to God. It does, it, the focus here is not upon the need. The focus here is not upon the supply. The focus here is upon the Lord. That, that's the emphasis here. We have access to the God of Paul, who is writing this. We have access to all of the biblical prophets, all the people, the ones that we look back and said, man, if I could have lived a life of faith like they did. Those that are mentioned in the Hebrews, all those different biblical characters that were known for their great faith, you know, we have access to that very same God and all of his resources. The one that parted the Red Sea, the one that uh, made the sun stop, right? How, how many things did God do that we look back and say, he would never do that for me? Can I tell you this? He can and he will. Every bit of it. Heard a story today about one that had to go in with a uh, medical issue that was no other way to explain it except to say that it was going to take a miracle to fix it. Went back in the next day or so, and guess what? Miraculously, the doctors are amazed because you know why? They met a greater physician. The needs are always greater, are, are nearly, not nearly as great as the supply, right? And even as great as the supply is, you know what's greater than that? My God. My God, the needs are here, the supply is greater, but my God is the greatest of all. Notice that personal pronoun. We talk about pronouns a lot in society, right? Here's a pronoun you need to understand. Tie, pair it up with this word, my God. My God. He is my God. We have access to that Father. And every time knowing, knowing that we have access to this God, my God, that should drive us right back to Scripture again and again, right? You know, I have this need in my life. Well, can I tell you, most of the needs that we have, they were needed somewhere else in Scripture too. 
And so what's going what's to drive you back to Scripture? Hey, oh, Paul had this need. Oh, Joseph had this need. Oh, whoever had this need. Let me go back and see how God provided for them. That should drive us back to God's Word to say, you know what? God did it for him. That God, the God of Paul, the God of Moses, the God of all these, that's my God. And if I, if I get in on my face, and if it's God really in all this, he can supply to meet that need. If that is genuinely a need in my life. Anybody got a need like that tonight? Anybody got a need that just, they know there's, nobody else is ever going to meet that need. It's only through God. It's only what he can do, and it's only through his provision that that supply can come into your life. Whatever it is, whatever that provision is, you cry out to him for it. I'm not going to say I can, I can meet your need. I, 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 won't, I won't do that. I'm not even going to say that our church can meet your need, but I will say my God can. I will say that he can, and, I, and he will, if you trust in him. If you put it all in his plate and allow him to work in your life, either what will happen is your need will be met or your desires of what we call needs will line up with what his needs are for you. Right? His will. That's, that's the way he works. That's the God we serve. I told you it would be brief tonight. There it is. Amen. You've got, you've got needs. We've got a supply. But even greater than the, both of those is my God. Amen? Let's pray.